How are we this morning? Good. Man, it's so good to see you all and uh, just, just excited to be here. It's a good day to be in church. I heard it's raining outside. Is this true? <laughs> well, the Lord's going to rain on the inside. Come on, somebody. <laughs> excited to be here and um, always very honored. Me and my wife, Anna, she's here with me this, this service. We, uh, we consider your pastors, Josh and Crystal, some of our dear friends and just grateful to serve this city alongside of them and alongside of you guys. And uh, as, as your pastor said on the video, we're better together. We're better together. I, I, I remember, um, I don't remember how many years it's been, but I remember when you guys first moved to Richmond, we met you guys when their launch team consisted of just them. <laughs> and uh, Heights Church was just a dream that God had put in their heart. And it's been amazing to see God bring it to life over these last several years and all that God is doing in this house and all over the city of Richmond. And we're just excited to serve alongside of you guys. Uh, we're getting ready to launch four months from now and uh, very grateful for y'all's church and your voice and what we're doing. I got a call from your team a few months ago and they said, hey, we're, you know, we have a building now. We're not doing the setup and tear down in the schools like we did for the first few years. So we have this trailer, and it's full of portable church equipment, and we don't use it. So do you want to come look at it? Come on, so that's a great phone call to get. It was a resounding yes. I'll come look at it for sure. And I came and looked at it, and I'm, you know, we're going to try to pay him for it. You know, use price, of course. It's a few years old. And uh, <laughs> this top-notch equipment is exactly what we need. We're launching as a portable church, again, in four months. And uh, they said, hey, it's, it's yours. We don't want a dime. It's yours. You have the whole trailer with the stuff. So, isn't that awesome? It's like, man, who, who does this? Who does that, right? I'll tell you who does that. Kingdom-minded churches and pastors and leaders do that. And, uh, you know, like your pastor started a series last week called This Is Us, asking the question, who are we as Heights Church? And, and even for us, who are we as Oasis Church? And who are we just as followers of Jesus? And, and I think who we are is we're kingdom-minded people that don't just care about building our church. We care about building the church. And you're in a house today, Heights Church, that cares about building the church and serving the city of Richmond and we're so grateful for your investment into us and uh, for the friendship that your church has been to us and we're just excited to see what God is doing in the city. Anybody see God moving in Richmond in awesome ways? I love it. If you have your Bible with you this morning, you can go to the book of Luke chapter number 17 is where I'm going to read out of. We'll have it on the screen as well. I'd like to continue to move the ball down the field a little bit in this series this is us. Talk about who we are as followers of Jesus, who we are as the church. Luke chapter number 17, I'm going to read starting in verse number 11. If you guys could help me out today, that'd be great. If something sounds good, you can say amen. You can say that's good. You can point at your neighbor and say they need to hear that. You, you, can, you can do whatever. Verse number 11, Luke 17. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him, and they stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. Don't you love that? Verse 15, there was one of them. When he saw he was healed, he came back praising God in a loud voice. Somebody say loud. Come on, when God does a great work, he doesn't need a quiet praise. He needs a loud praise. He threw himself at Jesus' feet, and he thanked him. He was a Samaritan. Verse number 17, Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? And then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Isn't that a beautiful passage of scripture? Your faith has made you well. For a few moments that we have this morning, I'd like to talk to us around this idea of prayer and praise. Prayer and praise. Who are, who are we as the church? Who are we as followers of Jesus? I believe we're, we live a life defined by prayer and praise. Prayer and praise. Father, we thank you for your word this morning and for these moments that we share. And Lord, I ask, 
over these next few moments as we open up your word that you would do what I cannot, and that is change our hearts. Lord, I ask that when we walk out of this room today, we leave not having just attended another service, but having heard from you. Lord, I know you wanna say something to us today. I know that you know every single person that's here, and they're not here by accident, but they're here because you wanna do something in their life. And God, I thank you that you love them and that you know their story. And Lord, I pray that you speak right to them today in Jesus' name. Our hearts are open, our ears are open. Do what you wanna do. And if you believe it, somebody say amen. Amen, amen, amen. amen. Hey, uh, have you ever set out to make plans or had an agenda and it got interrupted? <laughs> of course. This is life, right? This, this is difficult for me because I'm a planner. I like to have things straight. So interruptions, they bother me. Interruptions are inconvenient, right? Our, our life is full of interruptions. This happens all the time when I'm trying to travel places. Our life is full of interruptions. Even my brother, he was traveling the last few days, and he was trying to come back. We were doing some things. In the last few days, he's just texting me all the time, uh, delays and delays and cancellations and interruption, interruption. And every time we're interrupted, most of the time, it's, it's inconvenient, Right? Interruptions are inconvenient. Occasionally, there's interruptions that are good and exciting, but most of the time, an interruption comes with an inconvenience, right? Interruptions come with inconveniences. And what's interesting about the life of Jesus, when you read through the gospel stories, Jesus, his life, his plans, his travels, his meetings, his messages, all the time are full of interruptions, all the time you see Jesus is heading this way, he gets interrupted. Jesus is talking to these people, he gets interrupted. Jesus is preaching this sermon, Jesus is healing. Jesus is doing something all the time, Jesus is interrupted. But there's a difference when Jesus gets interrupted and me and you get interrupted. When we get interrupted, it's an inconvenience. But what's interesting about Jesus is he's always interrupted, but he's never inconvenienced. He's always interrupted, but for some reason, when you look at it, it's never an inconvenience. He's always interrupted by people, but it's never an inconvenience because people are his plan. When your plans get interrupted, it's an inconvenience for us, but when Jesus' plans got interrupted by people, it never inconvenienced him because those people are Jesus' plan. We see this all throughout the Gospels. In Luke chapter 17, this is one of those stories. Jesus, the Bible tells us, is traveling to Jerusalem. It's the city where he was going to do what the Father sent him to do. It was where he was going to lay down his life. He was going to die for the sins of humanity. Jesus was going to fulfill what his father sent him to do. He was going to take the cup. He was going to go to the cross. Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem to do that. Yet on his way there, the Bible describes, he enters this town and he's interrupted by 10 men who all have a sickness. They have a disease known as leprosy. Leprosy. There's 10 of them together. We don't know exactly how many of each, but we know within this group there's Samaritan and there's Jews. We know there's at least one Samaritan, and it could be nine Jewish people and one Samaritan, or it could be more than that. But we know there's, there's a Samaritan in this group and there's Jewish people in this group. And that, and that day was not socially acceptable. A Jew and a Samaritan didn't hang out. They didn't associate with one another. If, if you were a Jew and you had to travel through Samaria to get where you were going, you would add an extra day's Tri uh, uh, you would add a whole day to your trip to go around Samaria just because you didn't want anything to do with Samaritans. These people did not associate with one another. They did not hang out. But how many know misery loves company? How many know origin of birth doesn't matter when you're on your way to death? So in this group of ten, you have... You have foreigners. You have Jews. And they're all, they all have leprosy. The common ground is they all have leprosy. To give a little context on what it was like for them in that day, if you had leprosy, it, 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 the, they had a disease that it, it would eat at your skin. You would have boils and rashes at your skin. It would just eat your skin alive. This disease was, was a physical death sentence. It was miserable. It, it, it would eat your skin alive. There were certain strands of it in the day where it would attack your nerves. And so if you had leprosy, it was quite possible you had no feeling at all. 
So you would get harmed or you would get cut or you would get hit. And you would, like, so these people were just beat up because they had no nerves. Their, their skin is being eaten alive. And it was not rare for infection to happen because of this. The disease ate at their tissues, so their muscles and their limbs would just waste away to nothing. This disease was a physical death sentence. Not only physically was it miserable, but socially it was a death sentence. The Bible tells us in the book of Leviticus, in the Old Testament law, that it was the priest's duty to inspect people for leprosy. And if you had leprosy, if you were inspected by the priest and you had this disease, you were plucked out of society, isolated. You, you can't go back to your house. You can't hug your kids. You can't kiss your spouse. You, you are removed from society. You are isolated only to be with other lepers. There was no normalcy. There was no working. There was no going to the well to draw water. There was no going to the marketplace. You were isolated from society. Socially, this was a death sentence. You were done. Even down to the clothes they wore, the garments on them. If a leper wore a garment, that garment was no longer suit for anyone else to wear. It had to be burned. You weren't allowed to go near anyone. Because if you went near them they would be considered unclean now because you were in their presence. And this is why when Jesus comes into the town, the Bible says that they're yelling at him from a distance because they were not socially allowed to approach him. These men had to have some sort of faith on the inside of them, though, don't they? In fact, in the Gospel of Luke, 12 chapters prior to this story, in Luke chapter 5, Jesus heals a man with leprosy. So I can only imagine that when a leper gets healed... That word amongst the community of lepers spread like wildfire. There's someone that can heal us. There's no doctor that can. I've tried. There's no amount of money that can buy it. We're, we are done for. But there was one man who healed one of us. So, so there had to have been some hope, some kind of faith in this group of lepers. And we almost get the picture. It says as soon as Jesus walks into the town that they began to cry out for them. It's, it's, as if, it's as if they were waiting for Jesus. They had heard he was coming. They were waiting full of faith with a little bit of hope. Maybe he can heal us. Maybe. I love that when they cry out to him that Jesus listens and Jesus answers them. I love that those who society ignored, Jesus paid attention to. Those who society kicked to the curb, Jesus gave attention to. Those that no one wanted to go near, Jesus listened to. Jesus gave his focus to. I love, it shows this picture of our God, that our God is approachable and accessible. All this is so encouraging that you don't have to have some kind of status or some kind of track record to call out to God. You can call out to God right in the middle of your mess, right in the middle of your storm, right in the middle of your sin. God is accessible. We can cry out to him, and he hears us and responds to us. For some of you, you, you hesitate to run to God or to call out to God because you feel like you've got to earn it a little bit before you jump in with him. You feel like you're not worthy, that you don't have the track record that your friend has that goes to church more consistently than you. And so you're hesitant with God until you get it together a little bit. But this is not our God. He's approachable and accessible to all who call on him. And that's what these lepers are doing. These lepers cry out to him. They don't even ask to be healed, which is really interesting. All they say is, have pity on us. It's, it's a cry of desperation. Do you sense the desperate tone of, they're saying, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. They don't ask to be healed. They don't ask for a favor. They just ask for mercy. Lord, help us. Have pity on us. Do you hear the desperation in their voices? It's amazing how we get desperate when we realize our true condition, isn't it? When, when you have a, realization of your true condition, it breeds desperation in your heart. I'm convinced that these people prayed desperate because they realized their condition without Jesus. If, 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 if you find yourself lacking passion in your prayer, I would propose to you maybe because it's you don't accurately realize your state without Jesus. If, if we could begin to see our souls like these men saw their bodies, we would pray a lot desperately. If, if we could begin to see our spiritual state like these men saw their physical state, we would cry out to Jesus with way more passion. 
See, it seems like these men are far removed from our everyday life and our culture and our society. While we may not be in their shoes, I want to propose to you today, me and you are a lot more like these men than we think. While, while they had physical leprosy, I would propose to you that me and you, all of us, we've got spiritual leprosy. That left to our own, we have been infected with the disease of sin. You've chosen the wrong thing, you've said the wrong thing, you've done the wrong thing, you've thought the wrong thing, and you haven't just done it once, you've done it a lot. Because of that, we have spiritual leprosy, just like they were isolated from society. Because of our leprosy, we have been isolated away from relationship with God. Left to our own, we cannot bridge the gap. We cannot heal ourselves. We cannot make a way on our own. This was their physical state, but this is our spiritual state. It reminds me, uh, a few years ago, we were in Orlando, Florida, and we were driving around there, and um, the last several years, we've gotten to travel a lot, all up and down the East Coast, and uh, we have the Easy Pass in our car. Come on, somebody, Easy Pass is from Jesus. <laughs> the Easy Pass works on the whole East Coast. I don't know if you know this. All the way up, like, through New York and New England, even in Maine. Did you know there's people in Maine? <laughs> True story. We were up there a few years ago. Easy pass. Easy, easy pass works everywhere. It's great. Makes life easy. It's the small things, right? It's the little things. So we're driving around with our easy pass. We come up on a toll in Orlando. And when I say a toll, please hear me. I say a toll. Like Richmond, like 70 cents. Like, all right, well, yeah, it's cool. This toll, $8. <laughs> That's the number one combo at Chick-fil-A. <laughs> That's a lot. $8. Pull up the little bar, you know, in front of us. It's just still. So we pull up a little bit, inch forward, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, and it's not moving. I'm like moving my easy pass. I'm like, where's this reader? You know, there's a reader holding it out the window. Like, what? Is, it's been like 30 seconds. Seems like forever, right? There's like a line of people behind you now. They're starting to honk and wave at you with less than five fingers. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's getting bad. It's getting bad. We're panicking, freaking out. About a minute in, we realize, we look up, and there's a big sign over the toll booth station. The sign says, Sunshine Pass. I'm like, what, you think just because you're Florida, you get to have your own pass? You know, like, <laughs> think you get to do what you want? Like, everyone else is on the same page, but Florida's in their own little world because they got sunshine. <laughs> so we realized our easy pass is no good. No good. Doesn't do anything. We need eight bucks, right? So... We start scrambling, looking for, like, coins, cash, anything, right? So we're looking in the center console, the glove box, the back seat. We're, like, throwing in coins, throwing in coins, throwing in coins. We got $3. <laughs> it's, like, been a minute or two. Like, that, that's it. We got $3. I'm, like, talking to the guy in the booth. I'm, like, I got a coupon for Bojangles. It's to work something. <laughs> Chick-fil-A sandwich, right? Like, something. Like, this has got to be worth a few bucks. We're, like, trying to negotiate with them. It wasn't working. We had $3. And we finally get to a point, we just pray a little prayer when something like this. Lord Jesus, please blind every toll booth employee here for a moment. <laughs> and may the cameras malfunction temporarily in Jesus' name. And we just gassed it right through that. Come on, has anybody done that? Any unspiritual people? You just gassed it. <laughs> yeah. I'm not big or bad, though. They sent me a bill, right? Like, what? Look, that was three, four years ago, maybe... Look, if, if we had to pay $8 that day in the car sitting at, that toll, at the toll station, we would still be there. I could have tried really hard. I could have prayed my best prayer. I could have done everything in my power, but I did not have $8. Look, here's, here's our spiritual state without Christ. Did you, you cannot pay God's toll. Left, left to yourself, you cannot pay God's toll. You might have a little more change than your neighbor. That's fine. You're still way short. Left to our own, left to our own devices, left to our own efforts, our own good works, we, we have spiritual leprosy, and it has killed us, and we are isolated from God. This is our spiritual state. And we see in these men 
their spiritual state caused them to cry out in desperation. And I pray that we would see ourselves like they saw themselves as desperate people, and that will create some passion and some fire in our prayers. We will cry out to God with more passion when we have a true realization of who we are without him. The more I get to know myself, the more I realize the more I need him. <laughs> These men cry out to Jesus in desperation, and I, I, I pray we're a people, we're a church that prays desperately to Jesus. Jesus, without you, we ain't going anywhere. Without you, we have nothing. We got our own efforts, and we can do that, and that can be fun, but uh, we, we, without you, it doesn't even matter. Lord, help us, Lord. May we be a people that pray to Jesus desperately, knowing that he hears us and he responds to us. Jesus, in his grace and in his mercy, he responds to these people. He gives them attention society didn't give them. He gives them his voice. He gives them a command. And I love the command of Jesus. Jesus doesn't even, like, acknowledge them. There's no small talk. There's no, hey, you know, nice weather today. How's it going? It's, it's have mercy on us. And Jesus says, go see the priest. Interesting, Jesus doesn't even address their sickness. Interesting, Jesus doesn't give them any promises. All Jesus tells them is to go see a priest. All they get from Jesus is a command. Go there. I love the faith of these men, though, that with no evidence of being healed and no promise that they would be healed, they just go. Isn't it amazing when you're desperate and you have nothing to lose, you just obey at any cost? Jesus, whatever you ask me to do, it doesn't make sense. That's okay, you told me to do it. You didn't even promise me it would work. That's okay, I'm going to do it. These men just go on a command. They go on the command of Jesus. I, I just wonder about myself and about us as the church. Man, do we, do we have the faith to just go on the command of Jesus? Whatever he says, you say, Nay, what God was saying didn't really make sense. God didn't even promise me it would work. There's, there's no evidence of it around me right now. That's okay. Did God say it? Faith is just moving on the command of God. And I love that these men, while they had leprosy, walked to the priest who would declare them unclean, as he probably just did in the weeks and months prior. Like, if, if, like, like just put yourself in there. and To, 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 to be a leper... You probably just went to the priest and got declared a leper within the last several weeks or months. And now Jesus is telling you to go back. I'm thinking, I still have leprosy. I was just there. But Jesus said it, so they go. And I love while they're on the journey to the priest. I don't know how long the journey was. Probably wasn't too far of a walk. While they're on the way, the Bible says, on their way there, they were cleansed. Can you imagine? what it was like amongst those 10 guys when they begin to realize that they've been healed. See, see, the miracle happened once they obeyed, once they were in motion. A lot of times I think we wait for a move of God where God is waiting for us to just move. A whole lot of times we want God to give us some evidence or promise or proof and God's just telling us to move. I found that the miraculous often happens in the path of obedience. I find that the miraculous often happens to people that are in motion and moving. These people receive a miracle while they're in motion. In the path of obedience, they're healed. And I can picture them as they walk and they're, they, they realize, they have a moment of realization, we're, we're healed. Not, not only physically was this incredible, but they get their life back. They, they get to go home tonight. For the first time in who knows how long. They get to go back to work. They get to hug their kids. They get their life back. Can you imagine the hugs and the high fives and the fist bumps and the chest bumps? We got our life. We're healed. Been healed. Gosh, I can't imagine the look on their faces, the joy. Had to have been ecstatic. Everything's changed for them in a moment because of Jesus. Everything has changed. The Bible tells us while they're on the journey, nine of them, upon realizing this, 
continue on to the priest. Because although they were healed, they still needed the priest to give them the thumbs up before they could go back. So they still needed the approval of the priest, the declaration of the priest that they were clean. And upon receiving that, then they could go back home. So nine of them, nine of them continue onward to the temple to get declared clean so they can go home, so they can get their life back. There's one of them, for whatever reason, just as people are going to the temple, there's one that just decides he's not going to go with them. There's one upon realizing he's been healed, he decides to turn around Go back where he just came from, back to Jesus. One, one out of ten is to go back and praise and thanks, give thanks to Jesus for what he had done. I don't know about you, I don't like those percentages. One, one out of ten stopped to turn around to go praise Jesus. And it, I think it's revealing in this story, and it's also revealing in my own life and in our lives that, that prayer is popular, but praise is rare. Prayer, prayer is popular, but, but praise, that's, that's more rare. Most, most can pray when they need something, but most don't praise Jesus when they get it. Many seek after the gift, but not many stop to give praise to the giver of every good and perfect gift. I don't like those percentages. One, one out of ten stops to go back and to praise. And this has challenged me as I've been preparing for this this week. I don't just want to be a person of prayer. I want to be a person of praise. I, I don't just want to be a church of prayer, although God's house is to be called a house of prayer, and we, we, we are going to be a praying people. But I, I don't just want to be a people of prayer. I want to be a people of prayer and praise. I don't just want to ask God for things. I want to thank God for the things he's done and he's going to do. Prayer and praise. This, this is who we're called to be. This is who we are, people of prayer and people of praise. I pray that God will make us people of praise, people of praise. There's a few thoughts that I want to share with you about what it is to praise and what I think true praise is all about. I want you to write these down. The first one is this. Praise isn't just thanking God for what he does, but for who he is. What's true praise all about? True praise, I think, is not just thanking God for the things he does for us, and that's good. We need to do that. But I think real praise, I think deep praise is thanking God not just for what he does, but for who he is. Look, please hear me. In Luke chapter 17, when this Samaritan comes back to Jesus, he does not come back with a courteous handshake, hey, thanks for doing that thing for me. You really helped me out. The Samaritan does not come back to Jesus to offer him a tip and a little bit of gratitude. Hey, thank, th thanks for that healing, man. That was great. Appreciate that. It was good. I'm going to go back to my family now. Thank thanks for that, Jesus. When he comes back to Jesus, this is no small, courteous applause or, or thank you. When he comes back to Jesus, the scripture describes him as throwing himself at his feet. This, this is not just a thanks, thanks for that. This is a you are God and I'm giving you my life. This is more than just, hey, you did a miracle for me. This is you must really be who they say you are. You, you must really be the Messiah that they talk about. You must really be from God because surely this did not come from man. Look, true, deep, genuine praise. It may have started because of what Jesus did, but at his feet right there, the Samaritan was praising him for who he was. He was, he was offering himself as a sacrifice of worship and praise. He was throwing himself at his feet in humility and surrender to say, you are God and I honor you and I worship you and I adore you and I thank you for who you are and what you've done. Deep praise moves so far beyond the things God does for us. Those are great, but deep praise is about who he is about his character, about his nature. 
You know you're becoming more mature in your faith when you can praise God just as hard when nothing around you is going well. You, you know you're becoming more like Christ when you can praise God in a season where you can't see God at all. You, you know you're becoming closer to Jesus when deep praise flows out of you, when you see nothing happening. Because deep praise isn't about what's happening. It's about who he is. Deep praise is thanking God. God, you are good. You are the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. You are the lion and the lamb like we sang about. You, you are a friend that sticks closer than a brother. You are, you are peace that surpasses all understanding. You are my joy. You are my ever-present help in time of need. You will never leave me or forsake me. You are the great I am. You are kindness and you are love. You, are, right, you, just, you can go all day. This is who God is. Man, I challenge you this week, before you ask God for anything, thank him for who he is. Thank him for his character. Thank him for his nature. Thank him for who God is. This is deep praise. This is praise of someone that's walked with Jesus for a little bit and, and, and wants to honor him for all that he is. I love the Samaritan. Doesn't stop at a thanks. Gives his life. In humility, bows down to surrender, say, Jesus, you're, you're, you're the one. You're the Messiah. The second thing, second thing is this. Praise resets our priorities. I'm thinking about the ten men. Can you guys hear me? There you go. I'm thinking about the ten men. As soon as they realize they're healed, they all have one thing in mind. We got to go see the priest. We got to get the thumbs up so that we can get back to life. All they're thinking about when they're healed is I got to get back to my life. I got to get back to what I want. I got to get back to, to the things I desire. When they're healed, that's all they're thinking about, which is why they continue to go to the priest to then get confirmed that they've been healed to then go back to life. But I love that the one Samaritan. I'm sure he had a family, and I'm sure he wanted to get back to life, and he actually would get back to, Jesus tells him, get up and go back. So he, he does get to all those things, but I love that when he's healed and he realizes who Jesus is, all those other things that he wanted all of a sudden seem a little less important. All those things that he's after, that he thought he wanted, that everybody else wanted, all of those things when he realized who Jesus was, they were still good, but he realized they're not as important as Jesus. I'll, I'll get to those. I like that. I'll get there, but this matters more. Praise has a way of shifting, of resetting our priorities. In fact, praise is what me and you were created to do. Praise is what me and you were created uniquely by God to do. You were created. I don't need to know your name or know your story to know you're created to bring God worship. You were created to praise God. Look, there's so many different people in this room, and you've all got so many different callings on your life. You may be called to do a lot of things, but you were created to praise him. Okay? You may be called to be a businessman, but you're created to praise him. You may be called to be a teacher, but you're created to praise him. You may be called to be a parent, you're created to praise him. You may be called to be a worship leader, a pastor, or a missionary, and that calling is good and it's fine, but you weren't created for that, you were created to worship. A lot of times we get our calling and what we're created for mixed up. We're called to these things, and they're good, and they matter, and they will get our attention, and they will get our focus, but that's not what we're created for. It's as if the Samaritan, when he realized who Jesus was, he realizes, man, th this is what life's about right here. I'll get to those things. I'll get back to society. This matters more. And I encourage you, if you're here today and you feel like, Nate, my priorities are out of whack right now. My focus is off. Things that aren't the main thing have been the main thing. I, I encourage you, go home today, go home this week, and just start to praise God a little bit. Just get in God's presence. Just begin to praise him. Praise has a way of making God bigger in our life and has a way of making the things of the world seem smaller. Praise will realign us. Praise will, will get our priorities in order. 
You'd be people of praise. The third thing is this, and I love this. Praise doesn't just honor God. Praise transforms us. We do worship God because he's deserving of honor. We do worship him. That's what we were created to do. We do worship him because of who he is and all he has done. But there's something, when, when, you, when you praise God, something happens to you as well. Something happens on the inside of you when you begin to live a life of praise. This guy comes back, falls at the feet of Jesus. And it's interesting, Jesus, the first thing Jesus says to him is, didn't, didn't I heal 10 where where the other nine? Jesus didn't like those percentages either. Where, where the nine? Isn't it amazing that God, Jesus knew that they would run and not come back, yet he still healed them? Like, the people that God knows will reject him, he's still gracious to? I love the grace of God. The people he knew would not come back. He still wanted them to have a better life. He just, it's the graciousness of God. But it also showed me how when Jesus asked this question, where are the other nine, it showed me something important, and that is Jesus notices our lack of praise. This convicted me this week. Nate's lack of praise is noticed by heaven. Man, I don't want to be a person. I don't want to be a people. I don't want to be a church that gets the attention of heaven because of our lack of worship. Jesus noticed their lack of praise. Jesus missed their praise. You know, Jesus misses your praise. He wants to hear from you. He noticed their lack of praise, but he also noticed the one guy's worship. He noticed the one that came. And I love how he responds. He looks down at him and he says, rise and go. Like, hey, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna keep you. You, you. You've surrendered. Rise and go back to your family. Go back, right? Jesus wanted him to go back and decide, rise and go. And then he says something at the very end that's interesting. He says, your faith has made you well. At the surface, you read this and it's interesting because you think, well, the guy's already well. He's already healed. He was healed when he left to go to the temple. He's already made well. What do you mean faith has made me well? I'm already well. Jesus wasn't talking about leprosy right here. He's talking about his soul. See, there was 10 men that day that had healing faith. There's only one man that had saving faith. There was 10 men that got a new body, they got clean skin, they got a healed body. There was only one man that got a new heart. See, praise and surrender and thanksgiving and gratitude is the difference between healing faith and saving faith. It's easy to have healing faith when you need healing. It's another thing to have saving faith and throw your life at the feet of Jesus. I want us to be a people in a church of prayer and praise. I don't just want to have healing faith. I want to have saving faith. I don't just want God to heal my body. I want him to give me a new heart. I don't just want God to do something on the outside of me. I want God to do something on the inside of me. I don't want God to just move in and around my life. I want him to move deep inside me. God, transform who I am. Give me a new heart. And I love that when we throw ourselves at the feet of Jesus... That's a prayer he answers every time. Are you grateful for that? It's a prayer God answers every time. Would you bow your head and close your eyes with me this morning? I want to pray for you.